here we've got two circuits using, and note that these are using the same battery, the same three resistor. So the same, same three resistors. We're just organizing them in different ways. Uh, and this one, we've got the three resistors arranged in series with each other and connected with the battery. Here we've got the same three resistors in parallel and connected with the battery. And what are gonna be some of the important differences there? What's gonna be the big differences between the resistors in series versus the resistors in parallel? Yeah, it's really all about current and voltage. In the series, series circuit, if you've got resistors arranged in series, what can you say about the current and what can you say about the voltage? Yeah, if they're in series, there's just one path. So they all have the same current. I mean, usually think of this as the, the full current. You've got current coming in. It's not like the current gets split up. They all get that entire current because current is what's passing through that path. But what has to be true about the voltages here? Do they all get the full 12 volts of the battery? No, what's gonna to happen to voltage? Yeah, they're gonna get different voltages. And specifically, we could say they have to split up the available voltage. Because if you look at voltage, let's say we call this zero volts, then the battery adds 12 volts. So this point is 12 volts. This point is zero, or this entire region is zero volts. This entire region is 12 volts. When you go across a resistor, you lose some voltage. So across the first resistor, we lose some of the voltage, then we lose some more of the voltage, then we lose the rest of the voltage. So these are gonna be some intermediate values between zero volts and 12 volts. And we have to run the numbers to figure out exactly what they are. But the important thing is the voltage drops add up to 12. So I usually think of this as all three of the resistors get the same full current, but they split up the available voltage. Are there any circumstances when you would expect them to all get the same share of the voltage? Like for this voltage to be split up one third, one third, one third. When would you expect them to all get the same share? Yeah, if they're all the same resistance. If these were all the same resistance, no matter what their resistance is, as long as it's the same, then this 12 volts gets split up into three equal pieces, four volts, four volts, four volts. But if they're different voltages, which one would you expect, or di sorry, different resistances, which one would you expect to get more voltage? Yeah, the four ohm resistor is gonna get more voltage. And how do we know that? What's our usual expression for voltage on a resistor? Right, we could say delta V for the resistor is negative IR. Ignoring the negative for the moment because that just means it's a decrease. More, they're, they're all getting the same current. So more resistance directly means more voltage drop. So the one with the most resistance gets the most voltage. So the highest resistance getting the most voltage. <clears throat> Any questions on that so far? So how does all this stuff about current and voltage play out in the parallel circuit? What can we say about current? What can we say about voltage in the parallel network? Yeah, they all have the same voltage because they're all connected to the battery in the same way. Again, if we call, let's say the point right before the battery, we call that zero volts. And the point right after the battery, we call that 12 volts because the battery provides a voltage boost. It's not just this point, it's this entire region. All these points connected by wire, that is a zero volt region. And this entire zone is a 12 volt region, high voltage. which means that each one of these resistors is a bridge from the same high voltage region, 12 volts, 
to the same low voltage region, zero volts. Each one of these goes from 12 to zero. This one goes from 12 to zero. This one goes from 12 to zero. So each one of these gets the same full voltage drop. They all get the same full voltage. In this case, specifically the voltage of the battery because the battery is the only thing they're connected to. If there was more stuff going on, like let's say there was another resistor here. If there was another resistor here, that resistor would get some voltage. So you'd have less than 12 volts available. So that would change things. They wouldn't get the full voltage of the battery, but they all, they'd all get the same whatever voltage is left over. But for the moment, let's assume they're just connected with the battery. They all get the same full voltage, but what can we say about current? Right, the current splits up. And this goes back to the junction rule. If you've got some current, let's say I0 going through the battery, that current when it hits this junction is gonna split up. You're gonna have, let's say I1 going this way, I2 going this way, and I3 going this way. So I0 splits into three pieces, which then join back up again. So we can say I0 equals I1 plus I2 plus I3 from the junction rule. Are there any circumstances where you'd expect it to split evenly into equal thirds? Yeah, once again, if the resistors are all identical, or I should say if the paths are identical, it doesn't have to be like two ohms, two ohms, two ohms. It could be like maybe one of them is two ohms, one of them is a one ohm resistor and another one ohm resistor in series. But as long as each path has the same overall resistance, then the current would split evenly. If the resistances are not the same, then it's gonna split unevenly. And how would we, or which one would we expect to get the most current? If they all have the same voltage, which one gets the most current? Right, the two ohm resistor. Again, going back to delta V equals IR. If you solve this for I, you get I equals negative delta V over R. They're all getting the same voltage. So current is inversely proportional to resistance. More resistance means less current. So the one with the least resistance gets the most current. So the lowest resistance gets the most current. And of course, the ones with more resistance still get some current. They just get proportionally less current. For instance, four ohms is twice as much as two ohms. So the four ohm resistor is gonna get half as much current as the two ohm resistor. Twice as much resistance and same voltage means half as much current. Any questions on that so far? So if we wanna apply this to the idea of power, there are several formulas we could use for power. First of all, how is power defined? When we talk about power, like if we say something has a power of 10 watts, what does that actually mean? What is power talking about? Yeah, it's all about, well, either dissipation or production. Uh, it's all about transfers of energy, which in the case of light bulbs is heat and light leaving the system. But generally power is about energy. And specifically, it's a rate of change. Change in energy, how much energy is transferred divided by what? Right, change in time. Power is talking about how fast energy is being transferred. It's measured in watts, which is just joules per second. Watts equals joules per second. <clears throat> so when we say the power is, let's say 50 watts, we're saying that 50 joules of energy get transferred every second. For an, and for a battery, that means how much energy the battery is putting into the circuit every second. 
as a conversion from chemical energy to electrical energy. For a resistor, power is talking about how much energy is leaving the system through the resistor, how much is being dissipated, uh, usually in the form of heat and possibly something else. Any resistor is gonna produce some sort of heat, some amount of heat. Uh, and also, for instance, a light bulb produces heat and light. A uh, motor produces heat and kinetic energy. A buzzer produces heat and sound. But it's all about energy leaving the system via that resistor. So we call that energy dissipated through the resistor. Any questions on that so far? So that's what power means. What else can we, or how else can we calculate power? What other formulas do you have for power that are relevant to an electrical circuit? Dissipation, uh, dissipation in this case just means energy leaving the system. For instance, as electrical, electrical current flows around this circuit, uh, the battery is producing energy. I mean, not producing in the sense of creating it out of nowhere. The battery has a bunch of chemical energy stored inside it. There's a chemical reaction going, in, going on inside the battery that takes a high energy chemical and turns it into a lower energy chemical and the released energy turns into electrical energy circulating around the circuit. But that electrical energy doesn't just stay forever. The electrical energy dissipates, that is leaves the system as maybe heat and light. If these are light bulbs, the energy is leaving the system. Uh, and yeah, P battery, the power produced by the battery, how would we usually calculate how much power the battery is giving off? And yeah, there's several different formulas for this. In general, you can calculate power as current times voltage difference. Because if you look at how those quantities are defined, current is how much charge flows per second, change in charge over time. And voltage is an energy density. Voltage is how much energy per unit of charge. Or if you look at it in terms of units, this is coulombs per second. This is joules per coulomb. The charge cancels out. The units coulombs over coulombs cancels out. Charge over charge cancels out. You're left with energy per second, energy over time. And that's the definition of power. So current times voltage becomes power because of the way these quantities are defined and the way they combine and the charges cancel out. So this is a very useful alternative formula for power. It's not the definition. Definition is energy over time, how quickly energy is being transferred. But current times voltage difference is a very useful alternative formula. For instance, for a battery, if you know the current flowing through it, you can just multiply current times the voltage of the battery, the epsilon. And that tells you how much uh, power the battery is giving off, how much energy per second the battery provides. This also works for a resistor. If you know the current flowing through the resistor and you know the voltage difference, the voltage drop, you can just multiply current times voltage drop. That tells you the power dissipation for the resistor, how much energy is leaving the circuit through that resistor per second. But having to know both the current and the voltage for a resistor can be inconvenient. So instead, we often make some substitutions. We know voltage, for instance, can be replaced just with I times R, thanks to Ohm's law. Uh, voltage equals current times resistance. So we could also write this as power equals current times current times resistance. I gets, or I times I becomes I squared. So we just get I squared times R. And this can be very useful because you don't need to know the voltage. Of course, this only works for resistors, not batteries anymore. I times delta V works for everything, resistors and batteries. But I squared times R can be very useful for resistors because all you need to know is the current and the resistance. You don't need to know the voltage drop. Or alternatively, what could we replace current with? If we go back to Ohm's law, current equals what? If we go back to the original Ohm's law formula, voltage equals negative IR. Yeah, solve for I, you get delta V over R. So if you replace I with delta V over R, the delta Vs combine to delta V squared. And then we end up with a divided by R. 
So these are equally valid formulas for power dissipated across a resistor in the sense dissipated in the sense of how much energy is leaving via that resistor per second, usually in the form of uh, heat and something else. For instance, for a light bulb, it would be heat and light. For a buzzer, it would be heat and sound. And power is very useful as a, a quantity to calculate to give you information about, for instance, how bright a light bulb is or how loud a buzzer is, or maybe how, how much work a motor is doing per second. Any questions on that so far? And a very useful way to decide which one of these to use, of course, if you know all the information, if you know the current and voltage drop and resistance for a resistor, you can use any of these formulas. But you can often, as a shortcut, uh, stop as soon as you know any two of these quantities and make the calculation immediately. This is also very useful if you know one of these is the same. For instance, in a series of circuit, what has to be the same about all the resistors? Uh, our equivalent, you could. If you wanted, to, you could treat uh, all the resistors as just one big resistor, combine them together using the R equivalent formulas and calculate power that way for the whole circuit. Or alternatively, you could calculate the power for each resistor individually and then add them together. So for instance, you could calculate power for this resistor, power for this resistor, and power for this resistor and add them up to get the total power dissipated by all the resistors. That should balance out the power produced by the battery. Total power of the entire circuit, batteries and resistors together should be zero because we should expect conservation of energy. The power being produced by the battery should match the power being dissipated by the resistors. Uh, assuming there's no capacitor. I think if there is a capacitor that changes things because the capacitor is storing energy in the circuit. But if it's just batteries and resistors, the power produced by the battery and the power dissipated by the resistors should cancel out. Uh, and yeah, in the series circuit, the current is the same for all of them. And since they all have the same current, it's gonna be most useful to use the formula for power that has current in it, specifically I squared R. Because then you don't have to worry about voltage at all. We know the current is the same for all three of these. And if current is constant, we can say power is directly proportional to resistance. So the one with the most resistance is gonna have What can we say about the one? Yeah, the one with the most resistance has most power. If current is constant, then most resistance means most power. So the four ohm resistor is gonna be the brightest. Assuming these are light bulbs, four ohm resistor would be brightest. Or if they were buzzers, the four ohm resistor would be loudest. The one with the most resistance is giving off the most energy per second because they all have the same current. So in a series circuit, they all have the same current. So the one with the most resistance is, produce, is uh, giving off the most power, the most energy per second. In the parallel circuit though, what's the same about all three resistors? Right, they're all getting the same voltage. So we wouldn't want to use I squared R because we don't really know the current yet. We'd have to separately calculate the current and that's going to be a lot of extra trouble. Instead, I would use the delta V squared over R formula. Power equals delta V squared over R. And of course, all three of these would work. It's just that this one is most useful because we know delta V is the same and we know the resistances. So in this case, power is inversely proportional to R more R is gonna mean less power. So which one of these is gonna be the brightest or loudest or whatever? Yeah, the two ohm resistor. If these are light bulbs, the two ohm resistor would be brightest. So note that this is another important difference between series versus parallel. If you've got light bulbs arranged in series, the one with the highest resistance is gonna be brightest. If they're arranged in parallel, the one with the lowest resistance is gonna be brightest. Because if they all have the same voltage, power is inversely proportional to resistance. Whereas if they all have the same current, power is directly proportional to resistance. Any questions on those examples so far? Or any yeah, I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. So sorry if this is like a dumb question, but in a problem that combines like both um, 
uh, resistors in series and in parallel, would you use both power equations or would you have to solve for um, R equivalent? I think in that case, you would have to uh, analyze the resistors individually, figure out the current through each one. Because if you've got a mixture, then neither of these really applies in its entirety. So if you've got a more complicated circuit with a mixture of series and parallel, I would recommend uh, analyzing the circuit to find the current through each resistor individually, and then either use I squared R since you know all the currents, or you could multiply current times voltage for each resistor, or sorry, current times resistance for each resistor to find the voltages and then use delta V squared over R. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions on that so far? All right, then let's take a look at some of the exponential decay stuff. Uh, what information have you seen or what ideas have you seen so far about exponential decay? Have you seen any examples yet of situations that would involve exponential decay? maybe some quantity that's uh, decreasing. I mean, we know the exponential graph, the core, the, the core shape of an exponential decay graph, let's say time versus some quantity y, is probably gonna look something like starting at some value, decreasing quickly, and then leveling off. And yeah, if you've got something, uh, a leaking pipe or a leaking tank, this often leads to some sort of exponential decay. Like let's say you've just got a tank of water and a hole at the bottom. It's gonna drain fairly quickly at first and then drain more and more slowly as the water level decreases. So it's gonna have a graph. If you graph like depth of the water versus how much time has passed, then it's gonna be draining quickly at first, decreasing its uh, depth very quickly and then getting more and more slow. This also tends to show up with uh, temperatures. If you've got like a hot object surrounded by cold air, the hot object is gonna lose heat very quickly at first because there's a large difference in temperature. So temperature would decrease rapidly, but then as they approach thermal equilibrium, it's gonna be changing more and more slowly. So that's also gonna level off to an exponential decay curve. Although instead of approaching zero in that case, it would be leveling off towards the, the uh, surrounding atmospheric temperature. Uh, let's try setting up an example with a tank of water though. I think this will also work well as a review of the Bernoulli equation stuff. Let's say we've got a container with water in it and a, a leak at the bottom. <clears throat> and just to establish some coordinates here, let's say that the height of the water, or the depth you might say, is height y which is a function of time, because as time passes, the depth is gonna change. So we've got height as a function of time, that's gonna be draining as time passes. And what other information do you think would be useful to know about this tank of water? Yeah, the cross-sectional area is probably gonna matter. If you've got like a very narrow tank, there's not much water in it. It's probably gonna drain pretty quickly. But if you've got a much wider tank, that's storing more water. So it's gonna probably take longer to drain. So the cross-sectional area is probably gonna be very important here. So let's just establish a variable for that. Let's say cross-sectional area is A. So A is the cross-sectional area of the tank. Uh, presumably circular, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, just some cross-sectional area. Uh, and if we want to set up a Bernoulli equation here, let's say we just got this narrow drain here, what would be some useful points to compare? Are there any locations where we know something about those points? Like if we know the pressure of those points. Yeah, if we take a look at the top of the tank and the leak, 
let's say the top of the tank we call point one and the leak we call point two. What do we know about the pressure at both of those locations? Yeah, they're both one atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, 101 kilopascals, which means point one and point two have the same pressure. Which means if we set up a Bernoulli equation, we can ignore delta P. There is no difference in pressure between them because they're both at the same atmospheric pressure. Which means what would be the only terms we would need to include in the Bernoulli equation? Yeah, we would need a kinetic energy. And why is that? Why would we need a kinetic energy here? and a potential energy of gravity. Yeah, they have different areas. So we're gonna need a potential energy difference, rho G delta Y. And we're also gonna need a one half rho times delta speed squared <coughs> because of the kinetic energy, the difference in area. And would we expect anything on the other side of the equation? Yeah, probably there's going to be a negative IR term. So, what else can we do there? So, if we start filling some of these in, uh, delta Y, let's say we're going from one to two. Because presumably from one to two is the direction current's going to be flowing anyway. From one to two, so delta whatever is going to be final minus initial. That'll be two minus one. So two minus one, if you take the height at location two minus the height at location one, would you expect a positive or negative result? Should be negative, yeah. So I think we're gonna end up with negative rho g y. And then how would we handle the difference in speed? Yeah, we're going from large area to small area. So this will be a positive value. Uh, I'm not sure that's really gonna matter though. The thing is once the water leaves this hole, it's gonna be back to a wide area again. Uh, why would height be negative? If we're talking about the direction current is flowing, we're going from one to two. And if you go from one, to two, you're going in the negative direction for height. You're talking about height decreasing. Um, could we just ignore that kinetic energy term? I think we actually could use that one because the uh, we've got a cross-sectional area for the tank and also separately a cross-sectional area for the leak. So let's call this A1 and A2. How would the speeds compare there? Or how would we be able to set up an equation comparing those speeds? Yeah, we could use the idea that current equals AV, which could be written as A1V1 
or as A2, V2. So we could write both of those speeds in terms of current. We could say V1 is current over A1, V2 is current over A2. I think that should work. <clears throat> Alternatively, we could just replace current with either A1, V1 or A2, V2. The thing is though, if we assume these areas are very, very different, Mm, would that work? Let's say we just replace V with I over A1 or I over A2. If we fill that in, and again, we're gonna be subtracting two minus one. So this value squared minus this value squared. And in that case, we now have just in terms of current. You know, I think this is probably going to make a lot more sense if we just treat this as having the same area. Let's assume that we have a much bigger leak, because I think otherwise the math is going to end up way too complicated. Let's assume we have a much bigger leak, so the areas are effectively the same. Probably should have thought of that earlier, but let's assume that the area of the leak is the same as the area of the tank. That way, we're not gonna have any uh, cross-sectional area difference to worry about. In that case, we just have negative rho gy equals negative ir. Also, as the current flows, would you treat current as increasing or decreasing the height? As the current flows, would, the, would that cause the height to increase or decrease? That should decrease. As current flows, water is draining out of the tank, so why is it going to decrease? So we actually should be treating the direction current is flowing as the negative direction. Not because current is flowing the other direction, but because current is causing the fluid to decrease, causing the height to decrease. So we're gonna to have to treat current as acting in the negative direction in terms of height. And to do this, we can actually set up what, how current is defined. Going back to the idea that we can still use the concept that current is area times speed. But what does speed actually mean? How do we define speed in the first place? It's measured in meters per second. So what is that actually measuring? What does meters measure? What does seconds measure? A change in height divided by a change in time. Speed is change in height over change in time. And we can actually write that as a derivative. Speed is the rate of change in height as time passes. The speed that water is moving is how much the height changes divided by how much time passes. And the reason why we're actually going to need an extra negative here is because as the fluid moves in this direction, the height is decreasing. So we're actually going to have to put in a negative here to represent the fact that the fluid is moving in a direction that decreases height. So the speed is the negative derivative of height here because height is changing in the negative direction. Combine that with our formula for current, A times, or area times speed, and we get current equals area times negative derivative of height. Because that's area times speed, and speed is just the negative derivative of height here. So everywhere we see current, we can replace it with area times negative derivative of height. 
Any questions on that so far? So if we make that substitution, replacing current with area times negative derivative of height, we end up with negative rho g y equals, and when we plug in area times negative dy dt, these negatives cancel out. So we get area times resistance times dy dt. And we now have what's called a differential equation. Uh, why is it negative rho gy? That was from the rho g delta y, because if we're going from one to two, from one to two, there's a decrease in height. So that means that the change in height is negative y. So negative rho gy equals area times resistance times the derivative of y. This is an example of what's called a differential equation because it's a, describing a relationship between a function and its own derivative or differential. We don't know what y is. We don't know how, what the height is at any time. We don't have a formula for that yet. But we do know how the function is related to its own derivative. And this is very useful because we can use what we know about derivatives from calculus to figure out what that function actually is. And one way to do this, usually we start by isolating dy dt, in this case, just by dividing both sides by ar. So dy dt equals negative rho g y divided by ar. So negative rho g over ar times y. So there's our differential equation. This describes the relationship between the height of the tank, like how deep the tank is right now, versus how fast that depth is changing. Any questions on that algebra so far? And at this point, we can generalize this. This actually fits a much broader category. The important thing here is that density, gravity, area, and resistance are all constants which means that all we really have here is we've got a function y whose derivative is negative some constant times the function itself. And this shows up all the time. There are many situations where you've got something that's changing as time passes and its rate of change is proportional to how much there is right now. This shows up with population growth, for instance. Assuming there's no limitations on resources, population tends to grow proportion at a rate proportional to how much population there is right now. Population times some uh, constant usually representing birth rate equals how fast the population is growing. This also shows up with radioactive decay, for instance, the rate at which a sample of let's say plutonium decays into stabler elements, stabler isotopes depends on how much there is right now. More plutonium means plutonium decays faster because you've got a certain percentage of it decaying every so many years. Uh, also with temperature, for instance, the rate at which the temperature changes depends on the temperature right now. So there's many situations where how fast something is decreasing or increasing depends on how much of that something there is right at this instant. And so it's worthwhile to create a general, a general theory of how this sort of differential equation works. So we can generalize this. Instead of specifically using density times gravity over area times resistance, we're going to call that quantity lambda for now. So we have, in general, there's many situations that look like derivative of some function equals negative some constant, which we're going to call lambda times the function itself. And that constant generally involves how quickly something is changing. In this case, lambda would just be density times gravity over area times resistance. In other cases, it would be different, uh, different arrangements of variables or different measurements. But lambda just represents the multiplier, the constant multiplier that converts y into dy dt, converts the amount right now into the rate of change. And this general equation can be solved. One way to solve this is by looking at it uh, conceptually in terms of what functions we already know. Do you know of a function where when you take the derivative, 
you get the same type of function just with a constant multiplier. Yeah, the exponential function. So one way to do this uh, to solve a differential equation is by making a guess. Let's say we guess e to the something t. Uh, we don't necessarily know e to the what t, but if we guess e to the rt as our function y, then to check if that really works, we can just take the derivative and plug it in. What would be the derivative of e to the rt? <clears throat> Yeah, e to the rt stays e to the rt, but you get this extra times r from the uh, chain rule because you've got to multiply by the derivative of what's inside. Derivative of rt is just r. So this fits the bill. This fits the requirement that the derivative of the function is the function itself times some constant. And we can check specifically with this differential equation by plugging it in. Replace dy dt with e to the rt times r. Write out the negative lambda exactly as is. And then y can be replaced with e to the rt. This is true as long as r equals what? What does r have to be here? Specifically, which constant? Uh, it, it could work if it's zero. It's just that zero is going to be a very unusual situation. But in order for these sides of the equations to match up, R specifically has to be this negative lambda here. Otherwise, the, if R is not negative lambda, then you get something times e to the RT and something different times e to the RT. In fact, you could even see this by dividing both sides by e to the rt. You end up with r has to equal negative lambda. So this tells us that e to the rt works, but only if r is specifically negative lambda, this constant here. So we can replace r in our guess with negative lambda. And there's our solution to the differential equation. Also, one other thing we could change here, what else or how else could we modify our guess that doesn't change the fact that it still works? What other modification could you make to this that still causes the derivative to be just R times the original? Is there any modification you can make to a function that stays exactly as it is when you take the derivative? Like what modification could you make to the function such that that same modification still shows up exactly as is in the derivative? In general, the one thing that's going to work there is a constant multiplier. If you have a constant multiplier, let's say times c here, when you take the derivative, the derivative of a multiple, constant multiplier times a function, you just keep that constant multiplier. So that means the constant multiplier still shows up on both sides of the equation exactly the same, and so it doesn't really affect the result. Which means our actual solution is not just e to the negative lambda t, it's any constant times e to the negative lambda t. So we can use this as a general rule that if the derivative of some function is negative lambda times the function itself, then that function, the solution to that, has to be an exponential decay, specifically some constant times e to the negative lambda t, where lambda is whatever that constant was. And we can apply that to this specific case. If the derivative of y is negative 
rho g over a r times y, the solution is going to be some constant times e to the negative this constant times t. Negative rho g over a r times t. So that gives us a function that describes exactly how the height is decreasing as time passes. Since it's an exponential decay function, it's going to decrease quickly at first and then more and more slowly as it drains. Because the less height there is, the less pressure there is pushing it through, the less difference there, or the less difference in energy density there is pushing it through. So this is something to watch for. Anytime you can read, you can write out some sort of equation and rewrite it in this format. If you can write the equation in this format, derivative of some function equals a constant times that function itself. The solution is always going to be something times e to the power of that constant times time. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Anytime you see a situation where the equation can be rewritten in exactly this format, you immediately can jump to this as the function itself. You know that it's going to be exponential decay. And whatever this multiplier is, is going to become the multiplier inside the exponent. And then the C itself, this arbitrary constant out front, is generally going to represent the initial conditions. In fact, if you just plug in 0 for t, you get e to the 0, which means this constant is the height at time 0. So we could write this as y sub 0 times e to the negative lambda t. And if you know what the original height is, and you know the density, the gravity, the area, and the resistance, you can use this to predict exactly what the height is going to be at any time in the future. Or alternatively, you could solve, you could set y equal to some value and solve for t. Maybe you want to know how long do you have to wait before the water level is one centimeter. Plug in one centimeter for y, solve for t using logarithms, and that tells you how long it takes to drain to that level. Any questions on that? And if you want to get some more practice with exponential decay in general, I've got a worksheet on math and cheese you might find useful. Uh, if you go to, I'll post the link in the chat. If you go to math.andcheese.org slash P7B, and there should be a link to exponential decay example problems. So you might find that useful as just some extra practice on that, getting familiar with the terms. Uh, we'll look into more examples of this next time, and I will see you then.